Oh, hey, it's the person who just dropped their phone beside you on the bus, right when the driver hit the gas, and now the phone sliding all the way across the sandy floor to the back. Neil. Neil Pasricha. And you can stop asking when we're going to have a chapter with Allie Ward because it's here. It's here. Allie Ward, she's here. She's here. She's with us right here, right now. Sacramento Rays, youngest of three girls who grew up in the 80s, listening to Dad Ward delivering the morning news from the local radio station. I'm talking Allie Ward. She's here right now. The Allie Ward who spent her childhood playing with bugs and just being told by her parents, come back by sundown and don't get tetanus. She fell in love with science. She studied science and film in college. She wrote for the LA Times. She won an Emmy for being a correspondent for CBS's Henry Ford's Innovation Nation. And she was a host of Did I Mention Invention. She's also been consulting producer for the Barack and Michelle Obama produced Netflix show Ada Twist Scientist and appears in the Netflix science series Brainchild and the science channels How to Build Everything. You know Allie. You love Allie. You know her podcast, Ologies, O-L-O-G-I-E-S, Ologies. Who doesn't? Number one science podcast in the world with 23,009. 92 reviews, including this one, which comes from Mindy FF, who says, Today I realize that Ologies is my go-to source of comfort when the day starts to turn bad. Thanks, Ologies, for making thank for making a security blanket that I could use years later. What are Ologies? Well, there are so many to talk about. There's Myrmecology, which is about ants. There's Scorpiology, which is about scorpions. Etymology on word origins. And Awesomeology on gratitude, starring me, yours truly, Neil Pasaricha. So this guest is, once again, beloved by all, Ali Ward. And thank you to any listener who listens, rates, subscribes to three books, and especially leaves, leaves reviews inspired by Ali. I read every single one, including this one, which I picked this week from Ali G4646, who says, I'm head over heels for three books and the overall concept. Thank you for the artwork. I am motivated to read, listen, and inspire more. And I want to say thank you for extracting the best out of each human you come across. Thank you, Ali G4646. Now time, everyone, to pull up your petrified stump and get ready to talk about self-help books. Starting a podcast, Skunk Predators, Life List, Servidology, Infectious Energy, Confidence versus Arrogance, Visioning, The Galapagos Islands, Fostering Community, Building Trust, Formative Bugs, and much, much more. Uh, did I hear you say you're building a studio? We are building a studio. It's a shack in the yard. It's not a big deal. But um, we're. I'm just building like a little office where I can sing while I work because I realized in the pandemic, um, working in the same house as someone who you still have a crush on, I don't sing while I work because it was mortifying. And apparently that's how that's what I need to do in order to focus. So wow. I'm just getting a little separate workspace. And also so that Jarrett can make whatever he wants and film and record whatever he wants. Yeah. Like yeah. squat videos for Instagram. Squat videos are forthcoming. I'm sure. I didn't recognize <laughs> him when he popped into the background just cause he was wearing the shirt. <laughs> he, um, when we walk the dog, he likes to catch some rays. It'll be like February and he'll be like, gotta get a little vitamin D. Take a yeah, I know. Why not? I mean, yeah, we're too pent up. You know, in Canada, there's a law that they, when I was a kid, there's a number of women that protested at Queen's Park. And they said, why are men allowed to take their shirt off in public and women aren't? So they actually passed a law for the entire province that anybody can take their shirt off. There's no there's no gender specificity. It's just you can, you can take your shirt off. Anybody can take their shirt off anywhere. That's wonderful. Free the nip. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Grammy's got eight giant nipples and they're all over Instagram. Like she had puppies. She just has mega nips and they're be- they're beautiful to see. But yes, Jared is um Jared is very very fitness oriented in a uh way that's utilitarian. Like it's great that he's like, I like to be able to help people lift things. So it's good to be able to, you know, it's like, it's it's nice to see. He's like, you can help more people if you can lift things. And That's like, the oh. opposite of my work working out where I work out in the basement to like intensely, you know, build muscles. And then my wife's like, can you, do you mind like, you know, just carrying this bag of soil to the trunk? I'm like, I don't, this is unwieldy. 
Where's the handles? <laughs> you know, how do I grip this? I need to like have proper posture. It's like the exact opposite <laughs> of actually, you know, physical and challenge to build muscles. I'm getting. So back I like that he's it. pragmatic on his weightlifting. He's trying to be. Yeah. <laughs> and this will be an aside as a tribute to ologies. This is the exact point in our conversation that our faces totally froze. At least hers did. And I couldn't hear her. I could just see her. Her flashing smile and then the text on the side of the screen of the Zencaster platform popped up. Are you there? I can see you. I can hear you. I said, I can just see you. I can't hear you. She said, does Zencaster not like us? I said, Zencaster does not like us. This all-in-one podcasting platform that I use clearly inferior to Riverside. Riverside FM, which Ali uses for ologies. Podcast tip number one. And it looks good seeing you with the bookshelves in the background. Are those organized by color? What's the organization? <gasps> What's going on back there? Oh, Neil, this is why we're such fad, fast, fast friends. Um, They're not. And I thought about it this morning because I went and got some of the books that we're going to talk about off my shelves. And I was like... I need to make sure that Neil and I talk about whether or not I organize by color because I don't. And I understand the aesthetic for some people. It drives me crazy. I could never live like that. <laughs> the idea of like a philosophy book being total, like next to a book of children's short stories is, I can't, I can't do it. I need the Dewey Decimal System. I need to know. Wow. Dewey was the original algorithm because it's like, if you like this, you might like this. And you're like, what the fuck is this book? Why is it okay? And so, yes, it's like, just go over to a particular corner of the library and it's got you covered. You're the first person I've ever met that's also Dewey Decimal. I mean, that I mean, was... I, I have like bookmarked the like all these library websites to look up the Dewey Decimal <laughs> number and Dewey thing. Do you know Dewey thing? <laughs> The website is actually librarything.com, a website and app specifically for the organization and classification of your books, which is wonderful. If you go to librarything.com slash MDS, which of course stands for Melville Dewey System, you will find a convenient button pressing tool to help you sort your books. If you want to complement that with another website that I use, go to classify.oclc.org, which helps you look up the Dewey Decimal numbers of all the books you have. So I love that. Whenever I go into a library or a bookstore, I always have to pee. It's been that way since I was very young. Like, I just get so excited that I'm initially, I'm like, I got to take care of some business and then I can take, take care of this business. It's but, funny um, that it's pee because a lot of people say it's the classic Seinfeld bit that, you know, the library is a, is a laxative, right? You've all, often heard I've that. I've never heard the, that Seinfeld yeah. bit. Yeah. So Mine is usually pee. I think okay. I'm a home bowler. I take care of it before <laughs> I leave in the morning, you know? <laughs> Let's get right into it. <laughs> okay, my favorite Dewey Decimal number is 741.59, which is where I used to go find the Calvin and Hobbes strips when I was oh. a kid, oh. right? And then, you know, Far Side would be there for better or for worse, which is a really popular Canadian cartoon, which I really recommend. They were all there. And then, as you said, like the outgrowth is, hey, skew a little bit left, and you're like learning how to draw with pyramids and ra trapezoids, right? Yes. What about you? Where do you? So you walk into the library. Mm -hmm. you, where do you, where does your interior compass point? I think that if I were to ask myself over the last decade, it would probably be right toward the self-help section because there are books there that I want to read, but I don't want to own. And so I'll, Ooh, one you know, five, eight point one. <laughs> self-improvement. <laughs> I'll go sneak over there to be like, all right. It's like the tired woman's guide for not wrecking her life. And I'm like, great, I'll take this for a couple of weeks. <laughs> Um, although this one time I was bent on becoming more financially literate, I was like, I'm in my 30s, I drive a 18-year-old Subaru, and I have no savings, I need to get my life together. So I was determined to change my life. So I went, I didn't want to buy a book, but I, is it Susie or Suze Orman? I never know how to say her name, it's one of those things I read, but I don't. I, I've heard Suze Orman a lot, but you know, never asked her myself, so don't know for sure. Uh, we'll say Orman comma S initial. <laughs> um, so I was like, I'm not going to spend $25 on a book. I'm going to get this from the library. Had it, didn't read it, overdue, spent $37 in library fines. Wow. No <laughs> cap like, rate on that. I was like, I could have bought this buggy book about financial literacy. So um, the moral of the story is don't be me. And then you're good. So ironic, too. Um, 
horrible. Because you're because you're spending the money to uh, mm-hmm. to learn about it. But but I know what you mean about self help in general, though, right? Because it's like the, either the answers on the cover or the questions on the cover. It's like four hour work week, hundred dollar startup, one minute manager. You're like, how do I be a one minute manager? How do I start a hundred dollar startup? How do I work a four hour work week? And you look at the table of contents. You're like, it's got to be. I feel like in every self help book, it's two thirds of the way through. If you just take your thumb, you flip, you know, two inches out of the three inch <laughs> book. It's always right there. You know, it's like start a stationary company in China that you can manage from your inbox. Like, there it is. Why don't you just put that as the subheadline? Which I'm never going to do. I'm like, that sounds like so much trouble. But I, I think that I also had this tendency to always, even in my like downtime, be working, if not on work, then like working on myself. And so it's not been until recently that I've been like, fiction you deserve some fiction, you know, like not everything you read needs to be like, you're fucked up. How can you change it? (laughs) You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to go into another world. So I've been starting to read more fiction lately. Well, that's been really nice. I feel like a a, a piece of fiction that you read when you were a kid, I'm guessing, is the 1959 classic, My Side of the Mountain by Gene Craighead George, which you were holding up. Is that like a taped version of it? What's on it there? Is that like covered in saran wrap? This is a handmade, custom-made book cover. My friend, uh, Dr. Tegan Wall, she is a TV writer and a neuroscientist, knew that I loved this book. She looked around for over a year and found a very rare signed copy because the author is deceased. Yes. Then she made this book jacket and for my birthday and included on the back some like blurbs from our friends about me. Oh my gosh. It says that, critical like, praise for oh, Ali Ward. Right. Crying. I was sobbing in the, uh, in a parking lot when she gave this to me, but, um, can you read a couple of the an- blurbs? So oh on, my gosh. On, on my version, by the way, is I have a blue green sky cover with a majestic falcon soaring and a boy silhouette in the wings. Titles in a scrawl caps that says, Surviving in the Wilderness will be his greatest adventure. Jean Craig had born 1919, died 2012, wrote 100 kids' books. She grew up in nature. Her brothers were two of the country's first ever falconers. She grew up like literally like doing the stuff in the book, like taking eggs out of birds' nests and exploring with her parents up in a, in a camp woods near Washington. And this whole book is about like a kid every kid thinks about running away few get further than the end of the block young sam gribbley gets the end of his block and keeps going all the way to the catskill mountains of upstate new york he sets up a house in a huge hollowed out tree with a falcon and a weasel for his companion and only his wits as a tool for survival you and i both know you'll file this under 813 for american <laughs> fiction so tell us about your relationship with My Side of the Mountain by Gene Craighead George, including what I see in front of me. And, and you know, if, you, if you're just listening to this, Allie's holding up like a homemade cover version of this with praise for her on the back. So tell us about this book. This book was like, uh, and I haven't read it in in several, several years. So I hope that there's nothing just terrible no, in it. I'm not going to um, ask you uh, what's on page 34 or anything. Oh, you're worried about like problematic undertones. Is that what you're saying? Do you know, yeah. Like I'm yeah. like, oh God, I hope, I hope that there's not, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Not, Cause I read this when I was like eight. And then of course you always go back and you go, um, oh gosh, I hope they didn't like use a word that we don't use anymore. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh. Well, but, I mean, um, but you don't want to, do, do you, do you, if, if they had, and if they did, like, would that somehow, would that color your memory of it or what would? I think it probably would, depending on the intent. I think if yeah. it were just, um, a change in like linguistics and nomenclature yeah, and things like that, it'd be like, good thing that we learn and move on. It's like Curious um, George, you know, it's the, the man of the yellow hat's a poacher. Right. He stole George from, really? yeah, even the very first Curious George, which my kid got from the library. It's like, he catches George in a bag and takes him oh on a boat. Oh, my God. That's where, that's where George comes from. I had no idea. Yeah, sorry wow. to sully your memory there. How no, old, but I'm saying, you know. <laughs> that's what we're talking yeah. about. How old were you when you read My Side of the Mountain? I think I was probably maybe like eight or nine. And uh, I think we read it for like, I want to say what would that be like third or fourth grade or something? Yeah. But I mean, looking back on it, this is a book about a kid who absolutely fucks off to the mountains. And 
in today's day and age, you'd be like, well, I'm sorry, your child just packed up all his shit and just took a bus and went and lived in the woods for a year? Like, who, who, do we need to arrest someone? Is there like a psychiatric evaluation of the parents we need to perform? Like, whatever. Um, but back then it was like, what a life. That sounds great. He's eating algae. He's making friends with a raccoon. Like he's making a fireplace out of clay. Like that sounds like practical magic that I would learn. I would love to learn how to do. But as reading it as an adult, you're like, what? Your, your kid just is going to go get Lyme disease in the woods? Like what? Uh -huh. I know. I know. We've become so protective. But you were eight or nine. You're living in California, right? Sacramento mm -hmm. yeah. area. Yes. You, this is pre-Goth Alley? Pre-goth. Okay, you weren't a goth. Goth is high school. <laughs> goth is high school? Goth is high school. So you're eight, nine. And what was the, <laughs> but you were like a, you, you did say, uh, I've heard you say in other other interviews that, you know, your parents kind of just gave you bug spray and let you guys go run around a lot. Yeah, we were very, very free range. Well done on the research. Um, yeah, I, I was the third daughter. And I think my parents were hoping for, I think they rolled the dice on a boy and I was like, surprise, two X's. <laughs> and <laughs> so I think that I grew up with a bit of like, you know, a kind of tomboy-ish lifestyle. So yeah, they would turn us loose. We lived next to a cow pasture that was miles and miles. And so we would just uh, try not to get tetanus on the barbed wire fence. And just one of my sister would hold down one end and hold up another and we'd scoot through the barbed wire and then get chased by Brahma bulls and look for polywogs and stuff and, you know, try to collect acorns. And so we were very free range. It was like the sun starts coming down, you smell rice aroni, you get back in the house, you know? And, and yeah, so I think that there was part of that that I loved. Was the book appealing from the perspective of, it was just like extrapolation from the life you already had? Like it was one notch above? Like <laughs> it was no, like, because of the kid. So Right. So just he sets up a house in a huge hollowed out tree with a falcon and a weasel for companions. He learns to live off the land. Blizzards, hunters, loneliness and fear all battle to drive Sam back to city life. But his desire for freedom, independence and adventure is stronger. No reader will be immune to the compulsion to go right out and start whittling fish hooks and befriending raccoons. Is it's, this? I mean, it's true. I've wanted a pet raccoon ever since, even though they have roundworms that can kill you and infect your brain, which they <laughs> never address that in the book. But um, with Gus, Gus is the raccoon, I think, right? I think Gus is the raccoon. But I think there was something about it that I always loved nature and I always loved bugs and I loved being outside. And there was something about putting yourself, especially as a child, into the rhythms of nature that seemed so pure. Like I feel like as a kid, you know, talking also as an adult about being overly protective with kids. I don't even have kids, but the idea of trying to find your place in the cosmos and the planet by like being forced into natural rhythms of, okay, I'm going to need fire. I'm going to need to cook. I'm going to need to learn how to forage. I think there is something that made me appreciate like a connection in general, just with like where we are in in the you know cycle of life, there's massive stuff coming out now too. We talk about self help books. the The book, uh, the Coddling of the American Mind, by Jonathan Haidt, who's been a guest on the show, um, and the new book, Stolen Focus, by Johan Hari, which is all about how there's a big chapter in there about how like the prevention of free range growing up is actually atrophying all kinds of mental and cognitive you know stuff in our minds. It makes us much less resilient, much higher anxiety. So it was a gift what your parents gave you. And you know, as a parent, I'm trying my best to see like how we can, you know, let our kids even walk to school by themselves and things like this. Independence is a value that's deeply soaked into you, it sounds like, but also, you know, into the character of this book. I want to know how do you define independence? Okay, how you think about that in your life. You recently got married to your boyfriend, Jared Sleep, your hunky yep. boyfriend of 10 years. <laughs> yes. uh, and I'm curious how you think about independence, like within your relationship. I just think that where relationships are is evolving very quickly. I'm, I'm married and happy to share how Leslie and I think about that. But how you're an independent person. You got an independent podcast. You're not, all of these is true. not attached to like a big, giant, hulking platform, right? Yeah, no, it's just, you're, it's you're, it's just, just me. You. Yeah. And, and your Patreon page, which as of, this week has 9,666 subscribers. Hey! <laughs> you know, 
We got the triple six right in there. Like feeds, yeah. feed. I had that on my phone number growing up, by the way. I got 666 like in my phone number. It was an exchange in my town. Um, so like, how do you think about independence? Is that something that, is that a value that you sort of cultivate and you kind of try to maintain in all these aspects of your life? Or is it just, has it happened accidentally or? Uh, that's such a good question. It's funny. I feel like, um, like, I'm not sure if you've been bugging the house or uh, if you've just been texting Jarrett. <laughs> we, even have, we had this really big conversation the other day um, about how independent I am and about how it's difficult for me to accept help. It's difficult for me to find help. It's difficult for me to rely on help. And uh, how some people are really collaborative when they make things and how I used to be like a painter and illustrator, which would involve these like long hours overnight. I'd be working on things on deadline and, uh, you know, with just music playing or whatever. And I don't mind working independently. Like I, I like that focus and that control over things. And so I think that this self-sufficiency has always been really important to me, knowing that I just had to rely on myself so that I didn't have to boss anyone around mm. and that I didn't have to disappoint anyone. And so it comes from this like dual issue of being like a little bit of a perfectionist and like wanting to do details that maybe other people would find over the top. And then also just the idea of me being a partner that someone's waiting on is like, but it may, it does make things difficult for people who are trying to help me or who want to take some load off of me, you know? And there yeah. is this feeling of, you know, that, and I lived alone for 15 years before Jarrett and I moved in together. And I was so used to, if there's dishes in the sink, they're mine. And, you know, if I put this over here, it stays there, whatever. And so having to learn to accept help and also like lessen control is tough when you've been rolling kind of solo for a while. But I think there was something about that in the book that was like, self-sufficiency, like in any, drop yourself at any situation and you can try to figure it out. That if I mean, old. page 20, page 24, he figures out how to make his own fire and cook up a catfish and says, I have never enjoyed a meal as much as that, that one. And I've never felt so independent again. And to me, that's a tension that a lot of us have, especially, so I see someone yet like you, Ologies is often the number one science podcast in the world. I mean, you are up kind of swinging with, if not swinging with you're ahead of you know the Neil deGrasse Tyson's and the Bill Knight you are this is it like you so now the, there's pressure on you presumably to like you know start filming and then you need like a videographer and then you need someone to do like you your YouTube channel and you need some isn't there a lot of pressure to like expand and make it bigger and and therefore to keep up with kind of the Joneses of the podcasting world who I see everybody's ratcheting up everything so how do yeah, you do, do, do you fight that off with a stick and hold to just a year a you oriented vehicle or are you trying to grow that musculature? And I don't necessarily think it's a good thing. Are you trying to grow the like managing of a team? Yeah. I'm rather than fighting it off with a stick, I'm just like hiding under a desk whimpering. <laughs> I mean, that's been a huge thing is like, okay, well you're, you know, you're on top in what you're doing. So you better build an empire. And I think it's tough because for me, I talk a lot about, podcasting styles about East Coast and West Coast podcast styles. East Coast being like the hidden brains and the radio lab, like produced, slick, uh, music beds, you know, tight team working on it. And then there's West Coast, which is like two people talking. You could stream the entire video unless someone admits to doing a felony. Chances are there's not a lot of editing. Um, and so that's kind of a different style. And Ologies is like this mix of that where I'm running it like a West Coast team, but I'm editing it with a lot of East Coast elements with asides and with um, sound effects. And Yeah, I, mo I'm, movie trailer you know, clips. There's a tremendous amount of post-production that yeah. you're doing. So I couldn't just uh -huh. like run... I couldn't run video of it because it would be a different, totally different episode. You know, like the a lot of the asides... Um, expand or take a tangent or are a segue. And so it's tough because it's like, there is that thing of like, when are you going to do video? Da, 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 and I can do smaller video assets, but when are you going to become an umbrella company and raise up all these other shows too? And I'm, Ologies started as such a passion project that it's really hard to lose my grip on that to catch something else because I don't want to do a bad job on Ologies. And I'm already 
like working so much. And so I'm really trying, this is why Jared and I were having this discussion because Jared's an editor and a producer on the show now too. And so, uh, you know, talking about at what can I not do for ologies so that I can bring other things up. And then I also have to ask myself like how much, how much of that is just capitalism saying you've got a thing now right. make it bigger. You've right. got another thing, make it bigger Right. to the detriment of the art or to the, the detriment of the quality. And so I'm really struggling with that now. And I uh, I have a couple TV jobs on the side that take up quite a lot of time. <laughs> I'm laughing just because I know how much you 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 you. Uh, it's going to be in the lead uh, when I introduce you, but you do like so many jobs all at once on top of this. But also, you're interviewing ologists. You might be interviewing someone from a chemistry lab in, you know, uh, Singapore or something. It's not necessarily conducive to like flying them to a studio out, away from their their test tubes and having this sit down parlay. This is not the format. You know, yeah. so it's like just because just because podcasting is going one way, it doesn't mean you have to go that way, you know. And, you know, a big thing that's funny is, you know, I started in TV. I, I, um, I studied cinema. I got my first job in TV in like 1998 or something, um, which went like a lot of my listeners were like not alive yet. Then. <laughs> but I've been working in TV for a really long time, like everything from like PA at the bottom, bottom, bottom of the call sheet to like, you know, being a working as like a producer or talent on something, right? And so much is like, great, you got a podcast. When are you going to get the TV show though? Mm -hmm. And it's like, mm -hmm. I've worked in TV so much and I've like, I've worked for Netflix. I've worked for Amazon. I've worked for HBO. And you're like, the money for TV, I've had my own show on Cooking Channel and like the money for TV could be so bad. <laughs> like, especially even if you are in a creator position, like you, a lot of times, like I, I, podcasting can be more stable. You have more creative control yeah. and you can make better money in it than TV. And like, no one decides whether or not I get renewed for another episode, but right, you know, with show. a Netflix show. Yeah. So well, it's funny because I, I don't feel like pressure to graduate ologies to TV. I'm kind of like, mm, this is, this is rad where I'm at, you know? Yeah, exactly. And some of it's the water you swim in, like growing up in California, you know, living in kind of near LA, there is this swirl towards the place you're at, whereas podcasting has been much more organic and grassroots around the world originally. But yeah, I, 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 now I'm hearing you talk East Coast, West Coast, right? And I'm in the middle and the money can be good on podcast. So I was, I had been meaning to ask you, what would you say to someone who is thinking about starting a podcast? Like, uh. It's a good question. I get asked that a lot. I just taught uh, at the USC, at USC's Wrigley Institute on Catalina Island. I just taught uh, a dozen climate scientists about audio storytelling and literally like a five hour lecture of like, here's how you start, da, 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 da. you know, everything from like, how do you get an RSS feed to what's the title of your show and what's the format and stuff. And, um, you know, the biggest thing I would say with podcasting is, Okay, a couple of things that have been key for me is start a Patreon first mm. because the people who are going to support you coming up are going to want to be there from the beginning and involving them in the format and opinions and like what art do you like is great and a great way to feel like you've got ownership. Um, put up uh, put up an episode zero a few weeks before you launch your first episode. That way you know that the RSS feeds are good. It's on iTunes. People can start subscribing already. And then when your first episode drops, it'll feed into a lot of people's stuff and you'll go up in the charts. Um, Tim Ferriss actually did a, a really good episode about once like years ago about podcasting. I learned a lot of stuff from him through that. But um, also think of the a podcast idea that is reproducible over and over again. Like this is a great podcast idea for you. You talk about something with your guests. It's reproducible. It's got a hook. It's great. Um, you know, so something that like a newspaper column, I used to be a newspaper columnist. And it was like, you needed a good column title. You yeah. needed a good lead As opposed to, to just two in. people talking. Yeah. Like have a, have a hook and uh, have there be something that the person who listens leaves with something in their pocket. They get mm -hmm. something from it. Mm -hmm. They learn something. They live their life a little differently. Mm -hmm. They appreciate something differently because people are out there like I was with the Dewey Decimal System you know, in the self-help section, <laughs> try to change their life. And like every episode, you kind of want it to change the listener's life a little bit. We're you know? learning animals. Like right. We, we crave learning in every, almost every, I always say this, almost everything we do, if you look at what's popular in any medium, it's oriented around you 
getting better at something. I mean, 158.1 could be the whole name of books. (laughs) He could have just called it the 158.1 world. That's self, (laughs) that's self, you know, that's self help. But we, it's true. We, otherwise you feel, how do you feel after watching two hours of, uh, something on TV, I won't name a show that I don't like or whatever, versus two hours reading a book in general. In general, after you've learned something, you just feel better. You feel yeah. more fulfilled. I do anyway. I mean, so I'm, I shouldn't sure. be projecting, but you know what I'm saying. So, yeah, so for far, sure. I started a Patreon first. I didn't do that. Thank you for the tip later. I wish I'd talk to you a year. Put up Sorry. episode zero. Also, another mistake I didn't. I made, did not put up episode zero. Think of an idea reproducible. Okay, I got, so I'm one for three so far. What else, what, what, other, what other things do you recommend? Um, I think, I think, think as a listener would think and, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions that you think the listener might want to hear. It's better to ask a question that makes you look kind of foolish because chances are the listener has those questions Mm. and you're a proxy for them. So don't worry about how you come off because you're really, you're really a voice for all the listeners and so I kind of show up with not only my own curiosity, but the curiosity of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And so putting myself on the line and asking something that's like, maybe it doesn't sound so smart, helps a lot, you know, it's for so, everyone else. So, such a good, such a good piece of feedback. I loved at the beginning of your episode with Lori uh, Santos, um, mm-hmm. where you're like, what is you done me? <laughs> and she's like, she's like, sorry, sorry, I don't, uh. I don't know that word. You're like, uh, you, do you mean, yeah? And she's like, I'm sorry. And you're like, you, you, do you? She's like, oh, you, do mean, yeah. Yeah, so that, that is. And I was yeah. just like, I was just, but I felt good about that. I felt, as a listener, I was like very, I loved you for that, right? Um, <laughs> my very first interview recorded before three books came out was with Seth Godin. I flew to Hastings on Hudson in New York. I sat in his studio, as he called it. And I said, this is a nice studio. We just had recorded. He's like, yeah, it's got a great patina. And I'm like, Oh, sorry, what's a patina? <laughs> it's like my very <laughs> one second in, you know? So it's get, asking those questions is great. Now we had recorded a two hour interview. That's the thing I got the most feedback on, right? It's just asking the stupid stuff. For yeah, this sure. is, this and, is, these are gold nuggets. I want to keep you to keep going. This is someone what, starting up. The a, other thing uh-huh. I would say really is, and you do this already wonderfully, obviously anyone listening to this, if you're trying to figure out like the authenticity is just default to authenticity mm. all the time, because mm-hmm. that's, the place where you're the most unique anyway. And I feel like when we come into something that's professional, we come into it like, okay, this has got to be good and polished and huh. And I've got to array, I've got to sand down and grind down any edges and surfaces and make myself round and presentable for this thing. But really um, it's kind of like rock climbing, like the little, those little crags are where people kind of get you and, and those are sticky and that's good. And so showing up as who you are, you will be irreplaceable. And then people will, they'll, A, they'll feel like they know you and B, you'll offer something that no other show does. And that's you, you know, right. so everybody else is stuff. taken. Yes. <laughs> yeah, is. As they say. Yes. As okay. the adage goes. We've got five wonderful, beautiful nuggets on starting a podcast. This is just beautiful. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I was thinking of you a lot reading this book. By the way, I loved it, I should say. I, lo- I loved My Side of the Mountain. It's wonderful. I'm going to be recommending it. I had, you know, as always happens on the show, I'm like, how did I not hear, you know, how did I not hear about this? And, and the um, the protagonist, uh, you know, Sam Gribbley, he l- loves animals. He loves animals. At the same time, he's also, you know, constantly hunting them and eating them. He, he robs uh, an egg from a peregrine falcon's nest and raises it as his own so that it can he can become a falconer. And I was thinking about this related to you because I was like, you are clearly an animal lover. You're playing with critters. It's all about nature. You have animals all over your Instagram feed. It's like animals, animals. And I'm like, but the thing that kind of made you first viral famous, right, was like the uh, the Mag- McNuggetini, right? And so for yeah, anyone, uh, what, what, you, what you say? But so do you eat? Do you eat meat now? I do, I do, and I, I try to be pretty conscious about it. But yeah, I'm so afraid, Neil, that I'm going to die and someone's going to mention the McNuggetini in my obituary. I'm like terrified <laughs> of that. I'm okay, like, so please put it on the record. Oh, I didn't. I didn't think it was bad. I actually really admired it. Like no, 2000, 2009, You and Georgia had this like funny, you know, like kind of pre social media really viral video uh, about you creating a drink with chicken nuggets, chocolate shakes, vodka. Blended together in a martini glass with a barbecue sauce rim. It went totally viral. And I was thinking about it because I wrestle with the idea of eating 
Me, I, I, sorry, I eat everything. Okay. At the same mm-hmm. time, I think of myself as like a conscious aware dude. <laughs> and so how do you navigate that internal monologue inside your head as an animal lover? Where do you net out on meat? How do you think about it? Um, how do you eat and why uh, do you eat the way you do? That's such a good question. And I think about it constantly, especially given the environmental impacts of factory farming. And I think that, and also just knowing the way that we consume in general and uh, how out of harmony we are with the ecosystem. So one thing I think I enjoyed about this book is feeling like human beings are animals that a lot of us eat other animals, just like there are animals that eat other animals. Lizards eat bugs and birds eat lizards and other birds eat those birds. And so we are all kind of part of this. Great horned owls eat skunks. Do they really? They're the only predator of the skunk because uh, great horned oh. owls have no sense of smell. Stop it. Yeah, oh I, re- I read it. I was reading about the 300 different things that great horned owls eat. I didn't mean to take you offside, but I knew you'd No, I, knew you'd find I need an owl episode and a skunk episode, and both are on my mind. Trust me. <laughs> According to author Carol Lee, almost any living creature that walks, crawls, flies, or swims, except the large mammals, is the great horned owl's legitimate prey. In fact, the great horned owl has been known to consume over 500 species of animal, over 200 species of mammals, over 300 species of birds. What is their diet in North America made up of? mammals, 6.1% birds, 1.6% reptiles and amphibians, and the remaining 4.7% be made up of insects, other assorted invertebrates, and fish. I.e., if you are an animal and there's a great horned owl near you, heads up. And they call it when you go owling. You know, not it's not birding. It's there. They say owling, and owlers are the hardest core birders because they go at night, right? Mm -hmm. While everybody else is at the rave, you're bird watching. That's when you know you're serious. (laughs) I hear that some birders, if they hear an owl, they'll count that on their lifer list, but others are like, I have to see it with my eyes. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. A life list is a record of every... So on that point specifically, like what if you're blind? Like blind people are birders, right? And and, and so the audio part counts. For me personally, I only count a bird on my life list if I see it, but I will count it on any subsequent list for that point on for the rest of my life if I just hear it. First one, I got to see it. I will say though, Ali, there are some birds that are notoriously, you know, bramble dwelling. So, you you know, you might hear it for, you might hear it for years before you ever see one. Because what are you going to do? Like, get to the thing in the middle of some of those wrens, man. They're right in there. What are you going to say? You so, can't get in there. You can't you need get a in whole, there. No bramble. You need a bomb squad suit for that. Yeah, you can't exactly. do it. I'm going, I'm very excited about your birding uh, uh, love. So, okay. Factory farming's bad for the environment. Yes. You know. <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. You know, and, and we know eating meat's the biggest source of greenhouse gas in the world, right? So now what? So what do we do? I mean, we grew up eating meat. Uh, there was a connection to nature in the book. So what, I know you're not, are you going out and hunting your own stuff or what's happening here? I'm not. But um, when I met Jared, fun fact, um, he was in my phone for years as the butcher because when oh. I met him, he was a butcher. So there was a a whole animal nose to tail butcher shop called Lindy and Grundy owned by two women who were married in LA on Fairfax. And it was very like, it was expensive, but it was like whole animal, sourced well, all that stuff. So I I walked into a party they were having on a rooftop. It's called a meat market. It was a singles party. I was forced M-E-E- to go. M-E-E-T? Yeah, awful, okay. terrible. <laughs> and I was forced to go. It was a singles mixer for people kind of in the TV and food industry. And I walked in and saw Jarrett and uh, I was like, oh no, this guy's hot. Anyway, we're, te- we're nine years apart in mer- in age. We hit it off instantly. Long story. Now we're married. But when I met him, he was in a chainmail out apron, like blood on his white clothes. No way. So, but uh, so Jarrett was a butcher for a bit, but he enjoyed like the art of it and the history of it and being connected to like what you're eating. And so he's he's like training how to hunt now because he feels like if you are going to eat meat, you should have some kind of connection to it. And so I have a lot of relatives up in Montana, so he wants to go on like a, a deer hunt with them. But a lot of conservationists actually hunt because 
and I interviewed a couple of deer experts about this, two women who are cervidologists. And they're like, yeah, they, a lot of times you think of a hunter and you think of someone who's stockpiling guns and uh, is maybe racist. But there's like this whole other sect of people who are like very on the blue spectrum and very I mean, yeah. nature minded. Well, it seems who, hypocritical to yeah. be against hunting and eat meat. I mean. Right, right. But having like essentially harvesting like one animal and eating that for the winter. But um, but yeah, I try to be conscious about it. I try to eat more like uh more eggs and uh smaller animals, birds than I do mammals. Some fish that's not overfished. So I try to be conscious about it. Yeah. I try to eat beans and protein and stuff, but I haven't gone full veg, but I would say I, I eat meat like a couple times a week. Oh, so you have tried, tried to trim it out of your diet though, haven't you? But I eat it, but I'll eat eggs and stuff like that. If I wish yeah. I had my own chickens and stuff and I'd just be like, I I would know the chickens are like, we consent, this is good, we're happy. And I'd be like, killer, it's the protein, <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay, uh, I feel like we went down a nice few different rabbit holes there with my side of the mountain, a wonderful coming of age story published in 1959 by E.P. Dutton. My copy has an actual falcon on the cover. Allie's copy has like a homemade cover with blurbs about her. And I want to kind of move f- back up into the world of self-help because your second book is called Excuse Me, <laughs> Your Life is Waiting, colon, oh, The Astonishing Power of Feelings. Am I right? Yes, By you're Lynn right. By Lynn Grabhorn. Listen, you asked me to be on this podcast eons ago. And I procrastinated giving you an answer on what my like most formative books were because I was embarrassed and I did not want anyone to judge me. And so I kept dodging the podcast because I was like, I got to pick good books that will impress people. And then I was like, what even are those? And then finally I was like, you know what? When you think about the books that stick with you, you just got to tell them those books. And then you just got to be authentic, follow your own advice. I had to be authentic. Can I I, I, I spend 30 seconds telling people about this? Just a picture in your head. This book comes out in 1999 by Beyond Books. The cover says, excuse me, in all black, then your life is waiting, all caps, the astonishing power of feelings, with a picture of like an alarm clock on the cover. Lynn Grabhorn, the author, lived from 1931 to 2004. She was a former ad agency executive and developed AV material and cassettes for children before becoming a life coach. The book summary, is there a way to always have a fat bank account or a better job or a delightfully smooth relationship or a better body? And if so, is it really possible to realize these dreams now rather than at some unknown future time? Lynn Grabhorn answers these questions with a resounding yes. And excuse me, your life is waiting. She says that what actually molds every moment of every day of one's life are feelings. Oh, file this one under 158.1 for self-improvement. Our favorite Dewey Decimal category of the day. Ali, tell us about your relationship with Excuse Me, Your Life is Waiting by Lynn Grabhorn. Oh, Neil, it's a bashful one. It's a bashful relationship. My cover, my copy... Cover torn because if I would read it in public, I didn't want people to see me reading a book that said, Excuse me, your life is waiting. <laughs> well, so you ripped the cover off. <laughs> so you have to understand the vulnerability that I bring to you on this day after literally like a year of you being like, Tell me your three books. And I'm like, I don't know. And then I finally am just like, I'm just going to tell him the three books that I think about. So, okay. So this is a book that I picked up from like a Barnes and Noble. It was on one of those end cap on the aisle things when I was in a a rut in my life, a deep rut in my life. I was in a relationship that wasn't necessarily going to go anywhere, but we were living together. I was a waitress. I um, post, 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 so post-secondary. Yes. You're, you're post, is that post college? Uh, I went post high school. Is it? Po- are you post college? No, I'm like 25. Oh, you're 25. Yeah, you're. you're yeah. So you're post college. Post college. Post college. You're still, you're still in California. California. Okay, Barnes and Noble, like Sacramento a, area. Barnes and Noble. This is in LA. I had lived okay. in LA for probably four years, mm-hmm. four or five years. Okay. I had done stints as a caterer. I was a waitress. I was working as a waitress at night, but then I would work in a call center in Santa Monica, which is like an hour drive um, at five in the morning. Wow. And I would come do my waitress job at night. 
Um, I lived with a with a boyfriend. We lived in an apartment that had outdoor carpeting indoors, and it smelled like dog pee. It was like a basementy <laughs> apartment, mold damage, not good. Uh, my boyfriend did not have a job for most of the relationship, and so I was in a bit of a rut. And I was like, "What am I? What am I do?" And so I, for some reason, was like at the mall. It was probably the Grove, and I picked up this book, and I like w- was like, "I'm going to read one page." And it, ha- I forget what page it even was, but it just happened to speak to me because it was essentially like. If you're bummed all the time and you're not excited about your future, you're not going to get as far. And I was like, well, preach, Lynn Grabhorn. I'm here for it. And so I just decided to, to spend $14.95, which was a fortune for me at the time. And here's the thing about this book one needs to understand. It's very magical thinking. It's very, I would even say, victim blamey. It's like, if you don't have a good attitude, you're going to attract bad things in your life. And that's why you got cancer. It's like, if you don't have good vibes, nothing's going to go right for you. But as soon as you start just vibrating at a higher frequency, everything's going to come to you. It's very the secret in that. Law of attraction, right? Very law of attraction. Mm -hmm. But here's why this book made an impression. Not because like superstitiously you have to think positive all the time or else bad things are going to happen to you. And anyone who has adversity clearly just has bad vibes. All of that information, I just put in a capsule and put away. (laughs) But the reason why this book um, made my life a little different, the thing that I took away from it through all of this, which is why I had to put it in my three books, is there's, I remember there's this part where she's like, let's say that you really want like a red convertible, right? And you are thinking it's too expensive. The insurance is probably going to be too much on it. Uh, all of these reasons why you shouldn't have it. You're probably never going to own a red convertible. But let's say that your your dream has been to ha- drive a red convertible and you can picture yourself like driving down the highway, like heater on, top down, listening to Tom Petty or whatever, and really like get excited about like seeing it in your garage and like washing it on a Saturday and all these things. Like you start getting excited about it and you start envisioning it as a possibility and then you'll start to put little things in place. Maybe you'll start looking at them. Maybe you'll start saving a little bit differently, whatever. Um, You'll start noticing opportunities and taking those chances. And so the law of attraction and vibrations of thoughts and stuff like isn't something that sticks with me, but this idea that when you have a challenge in your life or something that you want to do or a goal my reaction as a person with anxiety and self-doubt is to be like, never going to happen, dude. But when I instantly click into, okay, but what if, let's say I get excited about this, I start to do the things that I need to do in order to get it done. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And some people might even argue you're also carving the neural pathways in your brain that kind of make those thoughts more and more increasingly likely to happen. And uh, right. the visioning maybe works in a sense, you know, although the law of attraction is this quote unquote, you know, disproven scientifically. Yeah. Who, who's to say that some of what you're talking about with the behavior change isn't true? And it sounds like it was true for you. So you re- you picked up this book. It's 19, the book comes out in 1999. I don't know what year you picked it up. It's, at, it's on the end cap at Barnes & Noble. You're in LA. You're in the ruddy, moldy basement with the unemployed bo- boyfriend. Uh, no judgment on the being unemployed. but like Bless he, his heart. He, bless his heart. Bless uh, his heart. You're sleeping on like a futon on the floor, I'm assuming. No no, no metal uh, frame for the bed. The, um, Something like that. Close fridge, enough. The yeah. fridge and the freezer are the same temperature. <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely very much don't forget the the previous tenant had a um an incontinent dog <laughs> so if you go if you sat at the dining room table you would suddenly be like this was definitely their spot like <laughs> so you pick up the out. book you read the book you spend a you know a chunk of your disposable income on it and and you rip off the cover to keep reading in public and then what happens what happens I think I start to think about my life, not in terms of what I hadn't done, but what I wanted to do. Like that was the instant change for me. I I think my like journal entries from that time would have been, 
there would have been like a what is it like a KP boundary like the when a meteor hits and they can see there would have been like a geological strata where you could see a change in terms of my thought patterns where instead of thinking I haven't done this I'm not good at this I no one's going to hire me for this I started thinking about like what do I want to do and what if I just took chances and at the time I was a painter I had never written anything professionally but I loved writing and I was making these little paintings I was selling them at the Fairfax flea market in Hollywood and um and didn't really know what I was doing but I was reading the LA Weekly that was like a yeah. free paper I would pick up and I would read it cover to cover great back then it was still independently owned it was like great. the like the village voice uh, yeah like or, the village voice yeah and it's probably got savage love on the back page type thing yes yeah absolutely yeah. cool illustrations I really wanted to illustrate for them and I called them up and I said hey I'm a painter I would love to send you like a portfolio and they said we're not taking anyone we've got a team in house thank you and I said okay and then I noticed the next time I read the paper that the art director's name was Ryan Ward and I was like oh wow. you don't say <laughs> so I called back again and I said hi can I talk to Ryan Ward and they said who's calling and I said oh it's Allie Ward and I said oh okay <laughs> so I get the creative director on the phone should not be there and I was like how you don't know me? My name is Allie Ward. It's crazy. We have the same last name, isn't it? Anyway, I'm a painter. I had to do some things, but I was wondering if I could send you my portfolio. I already called and they said that I couldn't, da, 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 but I was just wondering if I could get it. And he's like, oh, sure, sure. You can send it to me. And I sent it to him. They liked it. I ended up getting a job as an illustrator. I was like their only female illustrator. That led to a chance writing assignment, which led to me having my own column, which led to me getting a job as an editor with the LA Times, which led to all this other stuff, which led to TV stuff, whatever. And so- but there was this feeling where before I would have been like, there's, you can't do that. And they don't want you, you called and they don't want you. And instead, after reading that book about being like, what if you got excited about it? Like the, you know, when she's talking about like vibes and feelings and all of that is very like law of attraction, uh, hocus pocus. But the idea of what if you got excited about something mm. and how that propels you in directions that you wouldn't go, like yeah. if you were going to go on a vacation that you weren't excited about, you're not going to plan it out as much, you know? But if you're like, I'm so excited to go on this vacation, I know where we're going to have breakfast. I know where we're going to da da da. But if you're like, I got to go on a vacation with like for work with someone I hate, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. approaching it differently. Well, you know? we perceive energy naturally. When people say when they listen to ologies, your energy is infectious. What they kind of mean is because you were so interested in, you know, millipedes. I uh -huh. became interested in millipedes when I have never considered anything about <laughs> yeah. them in my life to use a recent <laughs> yeah. episode of yours. Yeah. Right. It's like it's yes. somehow that that but that's energy, right? Like it's it's your it's to your point, it's like passion attracts people, zoom, they, they kind of pay attention. If Look, I always say when it comes to speaking, p the crowd can only rise to your level of interest in your speech. You oh, know? that's so, t 100%. That's so true. And I think that when when it's come to me for like having people on ologies or giving people jobs or da, 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 it is the people who seem most enthusiastic a lot of times. And I'm like, well, if you're this into it, how can I not be? And I feel like you, by shifting from, I don't belong here to, I do belong here and I can do it. You start taking chances and putting yourself in places that you wouldn't. And, you know, for me, this idea of self-confidence, I never understood the difference between confidence and arrogance. I always was afraid to be confident because I thought that meant I was conceited and arrogant. And then, you know, in considering that confident means like with uh, faith, Fidel, like confido, it means like with whoa, faith. Whoa, 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 pause that. What do you say? I don't know what you're talking about. Open this so, up. Con confidence means I, faith. The, I was looking up the etymology of it one time and like confidence means with faith, like, you know, fidelity is faith. So confidence just means that you have faith. Oh, con means with you, and fident means faith, with faith. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. I, so didn't, it means, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't either. I always thought it was the same as arrogance. I didn't understand the nuance of it. 
According to the website etymonline, E-T-Y-M-O-N-L-I-N-E dot com, the word confidence does originally come from Latin Ali is right. They say fidere, F-I-D-E-R-E, is actually to trust, with trust, with faith. The word started appearing in French in the 1400s and now it comes to our definition today. To believe in the veracity or trust of another or oneself. I grew up Catholic, so it was like any... Any self love you have is like a <laughs> is like a Catholic is usually discouraged. And I'm kidding, Catholics. Please don't email me. But like this idea that you have faith in yourself that when you get there, you can handle it, and it doesn't necessarily mean I'm the best, I'm confident, I'm better than anyone else. It just means I have faith in myself that yeah. I can do it. And whenever I give a talk, like. I I had to moderate a panel and I didn't know until the day of that it was at the Dolby Theater, the Kodak Theater, which is like... It's where they have the Oscars, right? Yeah, it's like 4,000 people. I thought it was going to be 100 people in like a boardroom or like a small theater. And I was like, oh my God, an instant just like needed a diaper. Thought I was going to shit myself, like so scared. Hopefully you were home. I was home home at that point. (laughs) Home bowl, I was like, I was home at that point. I was like, I'm going to need a minute... And I, right before I went on, I was like, okay, what would I tell someone else if they were about, if they were this nervous? And it was like, show up like you belong. I belong here. They asked me to do this panel. It's in front of 4,000 people. I can do it. I belong here and have fun and don't try to be perfect. Just try to be yourself and bring some more casual I don't know, just bring some more casual levity to a lot of our interactions. I feel like so many times, whether it's a job interview or a date or whatever, we try to be really professional and that just makes us stiff and not ourselves. And that doesn't put other people at ease. But if you are having a little bit of fun, you typically put other people at ease, which is great. And it's good feedback loop. So show up like you belong belong. and have fun. Have fun. (laughs) And don't try to be perfect. Just try to be yourself. Don't try to be perfect. Those are great like, pieces of advice. And you draw, it seems like you naturally draw a lot of these things from, I, I, I'm, i so one of the core values of three books is no book shame, no book guilt. So yes. I hope in talking about this and putting this out into the world a little bit more, you know, we, we I don't know where that book cover is, you know, maybe it's <laughs> long gone, but I almost want to like mail you one, like, so you can tape it back <laughs> and not, not be arrogant about it, but just be confident about your connection with this book. We might have another copy. I think I got it for Jarrett a while back. But it, I would say if someone is feeling if someone is feeling sheepish about that or feeling a little like it's a little woo woo for them, the uh, you're a badass has a lot of the similar like getting out of a rut, having are, some confidence. You are a badass by Jan, Jen Sincero, S-I-N-C-E-R-O. Yeah. So you're holding up a yellow book, uh, a, a popular, more recent recent self help book that you say is in that same lineage. But yes, in yes. the same kind a of in the same flavor. Descendant. Yes. But in general, like if there's something that you want to do, like sitting down with yourself and like a journal or a Google Doc and asking yourself like what really lights you up and what you want to do. Um and living in that uh space of like having butterflies for a goal mm. is will get you so much farther. It's the such better fuel than being like, I can never do this. I don't belong here. It's going to be hard. What if it doesn't work? Uh, just before you know it, you'll end up taking little steps that you wouldn't have emboldening yourself in a way that maybe you wouldn't have. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's also the, the show up like you belong is also, I think, so important because so many people, especially people who have been historically excluded from things and marginalized and disenfranchised, uh, don't feel like they belong and are told that they don't belong in places. And I feel like it's so important for people who society has told them they don't belong there and they've internalized that or they feel up against that to like have to be an advocate for yourself and have to tell yourself that, yes, you belong and fight to fight to be there and have faith that you do belong because the all the wrong people tend to have imposter syndrome. So that's another message from it that I feel like I I got. 
I, I love that. And I love that. I love that simple advice, you know, open up a Google doc, open up a, a word doc. I, off, I In the happiness equation, I have this thing called the Saturday morning test, which is asking yourself, what do you do on a Saturday morning when you have nothing to do? Like as a way to <laughs> sort of spitball your interest. But I also thought I was, I was thinking that you might say vision board. I was expecting you to say that because in 2008, you worked at a newspaper where you said you kept a secret document called life goals. And you wrote <laughs> in that document... Here's the thing you wrote. You wrote this in 2008 to I have can't a show. You found this, dude. To, that's amazing. You know what I'm going to say, right? To have a yep. show that deals with science and learning and snakes and bugs and algae and travel and maybe kids. So, like, what yep. is visioning to you? And, or how do you practice visioning in your life today? Oh, that's so funny you found that. I ended up putting that on a cake when I got my own show on CW. I had that written like in frosting on a sheet cake. Um, because that was a, that was a huge goal of mine. And I think that, you know, the, the, and the TLDR on that is I ended up getting a job, uh, for CBS as a science correspondent. My very first job was interviewing a 17 year old kid who was at MIT about her work with algae as a biofuel. And I was like, I wrote this, like, I wrote that down, like so many years ago. And that is in like just bonkers that it actually fell into place that way. But um, I think that being really specific about your goals can be so helpful in the way that it just keeps aligning you back to what you want. Like if you write your goals down and you have to look at them and you're honest with yourself Which about is them. so hard. So hard. I so mean, hard. For, for me as like a waitress who had been like a PA on TV shows to write down, I want to have a voice. I want to be a writer. I want to, you know, work have on a TV. show. Like you wrote, have a show yeah, to have a show. That's, that can be really embarrassing when you feel so far away from it. It can be like, there's such a, a such a feeling of like, who do you think you are? And, but writing it down and being honest with yourself is such a first step. I feel like to getting there because you have to admit that that is that your desire is real or else yeah. you will stop yourself from going for it. Yeah. And you'll start to see, you know, like when you need to buy a car, your let's say your cars, your car died or whatever, you start noticing cars. Like you're like car ads oh. everywhere. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And yeah. you start noticing cars on the freeway. You're just sort of like, oh, is that a new Honda? Like, okay. <laughs> you know, it's like, and then and then you start wondering like, Everyone's got a car that works, huh? Everyone just bought their car. They figured it out, you know, whatever. I feel like you start to notice what is on your mind. And so like you you start to make those little decisions, like admitting to myself that I did want to work in TV. I did want to work in science. Uh, I ended up volunteering at a natural history museum one morning a week. And, you know, that wasn't something I maybe would have done if I didn't really ask myself, like, what do you like? Like, what lights me up? And it was the museum. It was like bugs and cool stories and taxidermy and meeting other people. And and taking that step to identify what I really liked ended up being like the best career move on accident. I started Instagramming stuff from the museum and then I got, you know, an offer to come in and, and interview for a TV show, which led to two Emmys and another TV show and all this other stuff. But it wasn't, until I sat down and said, okay, what do you love? Like what makes you happy? And I think a lot of times we're afraid to ask like what really lights you up and makes you happy because it doesn't seem uh, like it's always on track, but it ends up being really good to identify that, you know? Absolutely. And and there's so much to be said about pulling things from your subconscious into your conscious too, you know? Yeah. How much you stuff do you- You have to confront you, it. You have to confront it. And even just thinking about that now, you know, uh, I've got a big thing coming up out in a few in a few months, and I'm like, I haven't I haven't done that practice, and I'm I'm I I can even feel the fear already in thinking about that. You know, what do I really? really? Want what is it? Project? Can you tell us? Well, I have a book coming out. I have a book coming uh, out. Yeah, I have another yes. book coming out, and it's called Our Book of Awesome, and it's my first book of awesome in over ten years. And oh. from any perspective, you know, uh, it's it's uh, you know, everyone's like, oh, this guy's uh, written a bunch of books, so who cares? He's got another one. But I'm like, what are my, what no. are my? And, and then I feel 
afraid about it. I feel like, ah, oh, therefore it's going to be a big flop. And, you know, the time is ship, the ship has sailed. And, but then I was like, what do I want? And I, I can even feel like the anxiety bubbling in my chest, even thinking about it, you know, like, yeah. And, and then, and then the embarrassing part is when you tell people like, oh yeah, it's, they're like, how many books have you written? I've written, I've written a bunch. They're like, wait, what are you worried about? Like, what are you worried about? Then it's like, yeah. there's almost no, for you, for example, releasing another episode of Ologies, every other podcaster would be like, you're the number one show in the world in science. Are you, are you kidding me? Like you're in the top 100 of overall podcasts every day. Why are you nervous? Oh, why are you, why are you know. right? Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's almost like yeah. you're embarrassed about feeling so worried about it because you're successful or something. Yeah, but it matters to you. And, you know, I think, I think if you were to ask yourself, like, what do you love the most about this book that you, that's coming out? coming at a place of like promoing it from that and yeah. and being excited about people reading the things that you like the most. Like you start to reconnect with all the good stuff instead of just the, oh, the what ifs and the what ifs, which is, you know, a practice that I have to do every day because I constantly live in the, what if it all falls apart? Well, you know? and you and I both also share this same awareness of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivators, right? Like, so I, yes. I started saying, because I took inspiration from you, right? You opened every episode with ologies was saying like, our, please leave us a review. I really do read every one. Like, for example, this one from like Hank Five Hands in Tennessee who says this, right? <laughs> you, you do that. And I was like, okay, I'm going to put it at the end of the show. I'm going to be subtle about it. And then I was like, and then I was like, okay, I'm, I don't want to call them after the first few chapters of this podcast. I was like, I don't want to call them, um, reviews, I want to call them letters so that I'm not extrinsically motivated to like look at iTunes reviews. And guess what happened, Allie? I started getting letters, like actual letters, because I was like opening a crinkly envelope, right? Which is beautiful, but not, but I don't ask for reviews. So I've like, I've kind of lost the thread on asking my listeners for reviews Mm because I want to be so oriented towards this intrinsic motivator, which is, you know, actual people's lives shifting in a non- feeding the Apple algorithm sort of way, yeah. right? Yeah. But in exchange for that, there's all, I don't have that many reviews. Like in exchange for that, then you're uh, like, <laughs> you know, so it's like, but if I pay attention to that, then I'm orienting my brain towards this extrinsic motivator I don't really want to be caring about too much. Do you, do you wrestle with this stuff too? I get that. I totally get that. And I just keep, I have to reorient myself and say, well, you know, there are a lot of great episodes that have really helped people. And so the more people that see it, Great. Yeah. You know, the more people that are aware of the podcast, especially if you do it independently or whatever, like the more people that are aware of it, then there might be a person who's like, oh, I never knew this about my ADHD or, oh, this really helped me um, with pain that I'm having or, oh, this made me realize I really want to work with lemurs or whatever. You know, so I try to think about it in terms of the in terms of the listeners and like what new listeners I might be able to reach and have them help them by reconnecting them to science. You know what I mean? So I try to think about it in terms of like the listeners. And also I think about it in terms of how exciting is it if a listener gets to hear something that they wrote or their name on the air? Like, you know, I remember I used to call up radio stations and be like, will you play the cure? And if they're like, this one goes out to Ellie, I'd be like, holy (laughs) shit. (laughs) And so like the idea that a person can leave a review and have like a, a one in 10 chance of having their words read and their name read on their favorite podcast. Like that's pretty cool. Like, and then it also encourages people to leave a review so that if they like, if they genuinely like the podcast, that it, it gets to rise up past, you know, shows that have like NPR budgets and stuff. Do do reviews um, help rankings? They do. Yeah, they definitely do. And so it helps it, it helps it get seen. Questions to ask before you launch your podcast that I'm asking five years later. Yeah, I didn't even know that. So the more reviews you get, the more, the higher you go in the rankings. It can definitely help. Yeah. Which gets you just seen by more people. And there's so many episodes that people have been like, this episode changed my life because of, not because of me, because of what the ologist has to say. And I'm like, I like to do it in service of the ologist where I'm like, well, the bigger the show gets, the more people get to learn about this cool lady who studies sea turtles and like right. this this guy who's like tracking moose and stuff. So once I take it out of like, ah, but it's for me. And I think about it as like the cause and the community and the people that I'm interviewing and the environment and animals and stuff. I'm like, well, fuck, I'll, I'll put myself out there and be like, hey, leave a review. It helps us because then it just helps the whole ecosystem kind of grow. So I really kind of take myself out of the, the equation. Sometimes people will leave really nice things about me in the reviews, and I won't even read that on the air. I'll just read the good stuff about, you know, I get sheepish when it's like, 
I want to be Allie when I grow up, you know, kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's too nice. That's too nice. So yeah. I'll well, this is interesting too, because in addition, I love this. I really cl- could have used the six hour course you just gave, you gave to those, <laughs> those people. <laughs> Clearly, I missed the boat, but but I, I'm loving this because in addition, you literally to, missed a boat to Catalina. Uh, yeah, in addition to missing missing them, so I like how you're aligning your brain to the higher level purpose of the show. But in addition, one thing you're doing so well, this is another great lesson here, is you get the people listening to feel like it's their show. Yes aligning it to like the higher purpose of the show, like the intention of Ologies was always to make scientists seem like rock stars because we care so much about like celebrities and stuff like that. But people don't care about fellow humans as much as they do about celebrities. So it's like, well, A, I can get them to care about someone who's an expert in cicadas and get to know their personal story and, you know, how they met their wife or whatever. Uh, And also if they start to care about people they didn't think they'd care about, then maybe they will start to care about the person next to them on the bus. It's so true. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you, 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 you pop the celebrity oriented culture that we very naturally have. And the fact that you've been able to do that in LA is amazing. (laughs) Like you, you're you're basically railing against the place that you live in. Right. Because everything's it's, oriented it's, towards celebrity. Because of course it has to be. There's eight billion of us. We all talk on the internet. We need to have names and faces that we recognize in order to like navigate who's in the high school hallway here. So I don't, yeah. I don't fault our bio- biology for needing to do this meringue peakness of bringing people up and into the news all the time. But it's just, it's not healthy for us to just have the same people that are like, you know, you know Dunbar's number. Yes. Yes. I interviewed Robin Dunbar. No way. Oh my yes. gosh. What's that? What's that, episode? Ex- What's that episode? What's that episode called? Philematology. It was. <laughs> uh, it was philematology, the science of kissing, and it was 2020, February 2020, right before the pandemic. So I put this episode out, and two weeks later, a global plague happened. It was all about like kissing and microbes and stuff. But yeah, Robin Dunbar, 150 people is like the maximum number of faces that we can recognize, right? Absolutely. So as a result, you're you're pushing against that, which I really appreciate because then it makes people that aren't quote unquote famous, famous. And that is a nice reminder to be empathetic towards everybody. I I really feel like we are like I, I think about nutrition sometimes and I think I would never just like in the morning for Grammy give her like a donut and a bowl of Pepsi. I'd be like, I would never I love her. I would never, that's not good for her. I would never do that. And a lot of the way that we are in the news cycle is like, we are waking up and feeding ourselves a donut and Pepsi and then being like, why do I feel like shit all the time? Yeah. And, you know, I, having worked at several newspapers and my dad was a journalist, my sister was a crime reporter. Um, you see the other side of it where news is a business and it is for money. You know, it's no different than selling a hamburger at McDonald's. Like news is not a public service. And so what we get fed in the news is what we'll buy. And so a lot of times we we trust whatever they're telling us, not realizing that they're hacking a little bit of our neurochemicals to be like, if we scare you, you'll click on this and then we make more money. Um, you know, if this, if we tease you with a fact that you don't even really need, you'll click on it. If you see this celebrity's face, you'll, you'll click on this. And so we're not fed what we need. We're fed what makes money. And so I think part of ologies is like, well, if we're going to have this much context for like what Courtney Kardashian's, uh, you know, like waist size tattoo is going to be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. New tattoos. Like, why don't we, we deserve context about a tree and we deserve context about wind and a cloud and these things that a are in a little bit in peril you know? Um, but also like whatever context makes our lives so much richer and the more context I can give people on the minutia that they might have taken for granted, the more I feel like I can center us all into like this human experience of being a living creature on the planet, you know? And so I think I've been trying to just like put all just 
you know, on pedestals as rock stars so that we care about them and we care about their work and it gives life more context, you know? I'm inspired listening to you. I totally, totally feel that. And it comes through in your show. And I feel that on my show because more listeners came to three books from ologies than anywhere else. I was on your show in November, 2020, awesome ology. And I get, so everyone calls my number. They're like, I found you in ologies. Yeah. So that was, you know, <laughs> it, the the community you've created is so powerful. And the other person, um, or, not, or another person who is really oriented towards humanity and towards community is a fellow by the name of Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah. Right? He's, he's given so many commencement speeches about this exact topic we're talking about. He also wrote a book in 1985 called Galapagos, which is one of your three most formative books. This book, Galapagos by Kurt Vonnegut, published in 1985 by Delacorte Press, has a greenish gray cover with a large pinky red coiled serpent in the middle, rising up with its fangs visible, at least the cover that I have here. The title is a large brown caps in a thick marker type font, Kurt Vonnegut's name in pinkish red. And it says, according to the New York Times, a madcap genealogical adventure. Vonnegut is a postmodern twain. Kurt Vonnegut was born in 1922 in Indiana, died 2007 in New York City. 50-year-long writing career with 14 novels, three short stories, five plays, and five nonfiction works known for his very satirical literary style. Galapagos takes the reader back a million years to A.D. 1986. A simple vacation cruise suddenly becomes an evolutionary journey. Thanks to an apocalypse, a small group of survivors stranded on the Galapagos Islands are about to become the progenitors of a brave, new, and totally different human race. In this inimitable model... Novel, not model. America's master satirist, satirist, looks at our world and shows us that all is sadly, madly awry and all is worth saving. Dewey Decimal has filed this one under 813.54 for 20th century American fiction. Ali, tell us about your relationship with Galapagos by Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, well, number one, I haven't read it in a really long time and I don't know if Kurt Vonnegut is a terrible person. So I want to start with that. I hope he's not. he isn't. He's, he's not. Well, why would you think okay. he's a terrible person? No, he's great. I just don't know. And I'm I feel like I I there's no such thing as a terrible have done person. Everyone some might due have... diligence. <laughs> I think he's I, I I'll look into that. But I will say that so this book, I haven't read it in a long time, but the thing that struck me and I was having uh, I was like, which fiction book made the most impact on me? And I picked that one because the first time I tried to read a Kurt Vonnegut book, I was like, this guy sucks. His writing's bad. This book is boring. He's a misogynist and he's overrated and I hate Kurt Vonnegut. So everyone, guess what? Fuck you. I hate Kurt Vonnegut. What book Won't was that? I think it was Cat's Cradle maybe. Okay. Um, and I was like, not into it. And then someone's like, uh, do you know that it's satire? And I was like, oh, it's supposed to be funny. And they're like, yeah, it's supposed to be funny. And I was like, okay, let me try that again. And I was like, oh, okay, he's great. And so I think that the reason why I had like such, I had such a 180 realizing that he was like a satirist uh, and satirist, who knows? Yeah, we both messed that word up. Who knows? Yeah. But I think that I, I really appreciated what he did with the, just the medium of a novel and how dry the humor was and how scathing it was and how it looked at human nature in a way like we were animals, like the way that he, the observational humor of how human beings and their social systems interact and how we interact with the planet. And so Galapagos struck me because I, you know, read a lot about Galapagos finches and about uh, the Galapagos Islands as an ecosystem and convergent evolution and all of this stuff when I was a biology student. So Galapagos were like such like a Petri dish for how does evolution work? Obviously Darwin was greatly inspired by them. So the Galapagos has always been like this little treasure gem. And I've never quite understood like tourism to the Galapagos because it seems like the one thing that we should do is just not fucking go to the Galapagos. Do you know what I mean? Just yeah. like- preserve it. There should, shouldn't be tour boats, shouldn't be popsicle stands. No one should be like, I came here to see some penguins. You know what I mean? Just like trust that the penguins are there. We have great cameras now. Just like lay off the glass. That's just me where I'm like, I feel like if there's anywhere to preserve some sort of like island ecology, it would be the Galapagos. And so the idea that there's this cruise 
full of like like rich people and tourists and stuff heading there and it goes awry. There's there's some marooning there and then there's some like human evolution to deal with that environment. Um, I just think it had a lot of the parts of science and humor that I feel like are tend to be missing. And so I chose that book because I was so wrong about him and because of my my like uh, relationship to the Galapagos because science and humor typically don't mix. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, I, it makes so sense. And I also see in Vonnegut like a... Like when I listen to episodes of Ologies, there's like a scrapbook feel almost, like a collage happening. And I, and I feel the same thing happening with his stuff, you know, where there's a lot of zigzagging in his writing. And, it, you know, you'll get a, asides, basically, as you call them on your show. There's asides all the time in his stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so... Like he's been a really popular author. I have a book on my bookshelf, which I highly recommend to listeners called If This Isn't Nice, What Is? Which is a collection mm -hmm. of all of Kurt Vonnegut's commencement speeches back when they uh, weren't on YouTube and you had to write a new one every time. So it's like, he's got 50 really good and really different commencement speeches in this book. It's amazing. And uh, so he built like a lot of love, a lot of trust, a lot of community around him as you have done yourself with your incredible show. And I wanted to ask you specifically about that. We've talked a little bit about community already, and we've talked about some of the things you, you do to kind of foster a community, the way you make it purpose-oriented, the way you read people's names. These are things that, again, lots of most podcasts don't do this kind of stuff. The Patreon, the Patreon site, where you ask, you know, people for questions for the ologists before right before you interview them, and then you like, I guess you crowdsource them or you or you rank them based on like, you know, four people said this question, right? Yeah, yeah. Um are you doing anything consciously or subconsciously to build and garner trust amongst your people? Ologites, you call them. Like you call yourself I, dad, for example. Like what else is going on here? There's some real trust building <laughs> things happening in this community. You could open this up for us. It's funny because like I, my, my name, like listeners call me dad ward or I call myself dad ward now too. But I think it started because it was like I – you know, my, my dad just passed away in July. So my, but I, I had a great relationship with him where he was a really a curious person who loved nature, who loved animals, who loved building things. And he was the guy that would always be like, Hey dad, where is this? And he'd be like, well, there's we're like, Hey dad, what car is that? It's a 62 Corvair or whatever. And, and and he was just kind of like before the, in the internet, he was like our encyclopedia because he was just interested in things and he would pick up a lot of facts. And so, you know, I, I am not going to have kids. Uh, I can't have kids. And so, and I've, my career has sort of taken the place of where a, maybe raising a family would be. And so I think I kind of subconsciously, I never really fit with mom. Mom never felt right with me, but being I always felt like I'd be a good, a better dad than I'd be a mom. <laughs> and so I think this idea of like being, you know, I'm just like this weird lady on the internet who's like everyone's dad's like trying to be like, hey, don't forget to check your oil before, a, you know, before a road trip and stuff. Or yeah, you know, that's a, that's a praying mantis, Uthika, you know, just that kind of stuff, um, which is very like a very gendered parental roles, but modeled based on kind of what my, my particular... So I think that, that that kind of came out of that. Well, and, I, you know, you grew up listening to your dad on the radio, right? So you were, grew up in yes. Sacramento. He'd leave, leave early in the morning, I guess, before you got up. And then when you yeah. and your older two sisters and your mom were in the kitchen getting ready for school, your dad was there reading the news yeah. at the local yeah. Sacramento news station. So in addition to telling you that's a 67 Corvette and how to change your oil, like he's actually like the spokesperson for information in the community, yeah. And that uh, was something through a microphone that, through the airwaves as as you were doing. You know, it's funny because when my, you know, my dad, my dad had multiple myeloma and, you know, had it for nine and a half years. And when in May, it was a rainy day in May when we got the call, I got the call from my sister that his oncologist was going to stop treatment. And my, my dad had been fighting, fighting, fighting. And, um, and I had a conversation with my dad. I was sitting on a, I, 
was devastated and he had just had brain surgery. I'd been up there for that, but I was home for a couple of days and, you know, drove up next morning. But that night I had a conversation with him and it was funny because one of the things he said was, don't be sad. And he said, that podcast, we never saw that coming. (laughs) He just was so, it was funny that, you know, almost like a conversation about a recap of his life and a recap of who I was in his life. He was like, never saw a podcast coming, you know, because huh. ologies has been something that has helped me support them and helped my parents a lot. And, you know, when he was in hospice and we were getting to have those kind of important conversations that you replay and that you're so grateful for, you know, one of the things I said was like, you know, well, but dad, where do you think I got it from? You know, we grew up listening to you on the radio. And my dad just had this moment of like, Huh, I never thought I never thought about that, you know, like didn't realize his impact, I think, you know, and yeah, I think this idea of also having a voice in life, you know, for me growing up in LA in the late, you know, moving here in the late nineties as a woman, you know, the reason I got kind of, uh, tired of acting was I got, I got mugged and I, I no longer wanted to be in peril for others entertainment. And so this idea of having a voice, you know, my, my dad was a voice on the you, radio. You but act, the idea liter- of ha- actually mugged. Yeah. Yeah. Two guys with knives, broad daylight. It was not good, but this idea of like being a woman with a voice was something that appealed to me of like, uh, being able to write and being able to think and being able to put that out instead of just reciting lines that someone else had written. And so I think like Ologies was this mix of like, I get to write, I get to perform, but I don't have to pretend to be dying. Uh, I'm comfortable radio wise. Cause I grew up around that, you know, all these things that I'm like, huh, I, I didn't really see it coming either. I thought making a podcast would be, I mean, it's a huge pain in the ass. Don't get me wrong. I work so much on it. But yeah, I think that, um, I mean, I know we're off on a long tangent, but yeah, I do think that feeling like uh, that, that feeling with a listener where you want them to feel like you're having a conversation. I want my listeners to feel like they are sitting at the table with me having the conversation instead of, you know, just being an, an audience. I want them to feel like they're they're at this big round table and we're all getting to ask questions, you know? So I feel like you owe your audience so much. They make your whole life, they make your whole career. They've made my life so much better in so many ways every day that um, like kind of acknowledging them and having them in it too is a way of respecting them, you know? And they make the show so much better. Their questions are great. They teach me so much about... Uh, about inclusivity and about different ways of looking at things. I mean, it's, they make the show better. So it's, I really feel like it's like honoring them, you know, long-winded question. No, Long-winded no. Cause I started by saying, what are some <laughs> things you do in, in your show to create and foster this incredible trust and connection you have with your listeners? People always say, I love all these. And I love Ali. Like they say that right away. It's in the same sentence. I even saw um, in my local issue of Toronto Life. I, I always read it on the newsstand, kind of like you were talking mm-hmm. about. And somebody just featured Ologies this month. I should send you the clip. Oh. And it says right there, I love the show, but I, I, I love the show, but I fell in love with the host. And oh. I was asking, why do you call yourself dad? Because you say, hey, it's your dad. It's your dad. Dad Ward yeah. is here. And I I even Googled, why does Allie call herself dad? <laughs> And like nothing comes up. It's an un-Google. <laughs> you should own the answer to that. You know, I should. Yeah, I should you, have an FAQ on my site. Exactly. That one specifically should be a question because for me, because I will say for me, coming in relatively newer to your show before 2020, 2019 or whatever, I, I didn't feel like I was left out, but I thought this is a bunch of people that know each other. You know, I, you oh. could feel, no, no, not left out, but you could feel that there was something here. Like this is a room where, you know, uh, hey, it's Alia, the lady beside you on the bus. Uh, you know, you always have these like <laughs> these little like random asides. So yeah, so that's one thing you do to create trust. The Patreon thing is a really interesting. And by the way, for those like me, I'm like scared to do something like that because you're like, oh, I just picture like, you know, 17 people being in there, you know. You can't picture it being, but I'm assuming yours was like that too. You, you start small and it, it, because you cite it, you used to cite in the old shows, 
according to face, you know, Facebook community says this, but I know it's like all kind of gone towards Patreon. Yeah. Over time. That's where people, yeah, that's where I interact. And, uh, I feel like, you know, I set the bar, it's like a dollar to join. It's Mm -hmm. like $12 a year. Yeah. It's like the cost of like a sandwich somewhere. (laughs) If you get chips and a soda and, uh, you know, that your name might be read, that your questions might be asked. And what I've started doing recently, which I didn't do before is I used to just post like, okay, new episode is up, have at it. But what I started doing just in the last couple of weeks is I've made it into like a new episode is up discussion thread. And then when people will, you know, say, oh, I thought she was going to say this. And she said this, and I will comment on everyone who posts a comment on that discussion thread so that they feel like they're having a conversation so that they know that if they have a comment about the show that I saw it, you know, cause I can't always go through all of my, e- I definitely cannot go through all my emails. I mean, I count it and I have 11 or 12 inboxes between my, my DMS on Instagram from two accounts, my Twitter DMS on two accounts, my Facebook, my other Facebook, um, my Patreon, my public email, my private email, like I have so many inboxes. I'm constantly behind. So I can't answer every message, but on comments, it's nice to, it's really nice to comment back on people and, and let, let them feel like they're a part of it and that I'm a friend of theirs, you know, because that that is how I feel. And there are names that I read over and over again, you know, Edwin Munro, uh, Amanda Panda or Miranda Panda, like names I see that come up and up, you know, I was like, yeah. oh, it's another good one from them, you know. I, I'm glad you brought up your dad too, because I wasn't sure to talk about it. But as you do with your community, you shared the story of like your dad's battle with uh, multiple uh, melanoma, it's called? Multiple myeloma. Multiple it gets confused myeloma. with melanoma a lot. Yeah. It's yeah. a blood cancer. It's a blood cancer. You talked about the stories. You post pictures about the little ice cream cones that you eat with him in the hospice. And people post their, you know, hashtag critter for grandpa, you know, and and Mm -hmm. these things kind of go viral. What did you learn from him? Oh, so much. I mean, he, he was really someone who always wanted to be of service to people, always wanted to be helpful you know? And one thing I really learned from him is that he, he didn't like assume like malice often. He wasn't, he was someone who things could roll off him really well. And I think that learning to trust, like he was trusting in a lot of ways that I think maybe I I have taken on. I think sometimes, you know, and my husband sometimes will laugh about it because he's like, you're just such a sweetie baby because I'll be like, I'll just like trust that, you know, someone has good intentions, but like I'll try to Ret- return, return their uh, drone to them, even if it takes you six months. <laughs> I love returning people's lost items. I'd love it. I feel like most people have good streaks and I guess I try to find them or I try to in general, to work from a place of that until proven otherwise. But I, you know, I think my dad was a really hard worker and I was always trying to make him proud with how hard I worked, you know? And he would say this thing, he would text us every morning. He would say he's having his coffee and he would always end his messages, uh, right. If you get work, because that's what they would say to people when they'd go out West, right. If you get work, it's just the same. It was just like, keep in touch. And so he'd say, right, if you get work. Like meaning, like, let me know if you got a job kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Right, like, right, let right. me know okay. how you're doing. <laughs> yeah. But he would just, that was like his sign off. And uh, and it was funny because I like internalized that, which I, you know, a woman in my 40s didn't need to. But I was like, well, always get more jobs, you know. So there is this part of me that's like, I think I was, I was still always trying to be like, don't worry, dad, I'm good. I've got work. Like, uh you're, we're taken care of, I'm taken care of. And it's, it's funny because, uh, he was such a, he was such a hard worker that that's something that as a point of pride has stuck with me that I've, I'm having to unlearn, especially now that he's passed away. Like I, I can, I'm realizing I can say no to things. The, the four months that Jared and I spent up at my sister's taking care of him in hospice and stuff was really some of the most meaningful in my life. And I, any other job other than ologies, I, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I wouldn't have been able to podcast from my sister's dining room table, you know, uh, or I wouldn't have been able to shoot a TV show for my sister's dining room table or work at a law firm or something. And so, um, you know, 
that experience with him also realigned that it, I don't need to say yes to every job and that being with people that you love is, is at the end of the day, the thing that you remember and that's most important. So I've had to learn through his death to start putting my own life first, you know, and make memories and take trips and, you know, go to Disneyland for the day on a Wednesday and instead of working until one in the morning, you know, (laughs) so I'm really trying to learn that. But he was wildly in love with my mom until literally the day he died. They'd been together for 53 years and he was, they just were always so like flirtatious and in love. And I think that that's one thing with my, my marriage, like I had had a crush on Jarrett for so many years. We broke up because of our age difference and I, he was in his twenties and I was a woman in my thirties being like, I got to figure out if I'm going to have babies with this body or not. Like, I don't know. I got to figure out my career and stuff. So we, we kept, you know, breaking up cause we were in different places and, and, but we always loved each other every, all the time. And so we finally, uh, you know, he and my, my mom and my dad's kind of love is, was a big inspiration for just like, just let yourself like be crazy about someone like so in love with them. And so, um, you know, that's been a really, that, that was such a good lesson is, and I, I just found a card that my dad sent when Jarrett and I got engaged in 2020 and it was so sweet. It just said, you know, congratulations. So happy for you guys. Just remember to always, always be friends first. And I was like, that was just a message that I had forgotten that he wrote, but, you know, reading it a few months after he passed was, uh, was really it was really sweet to read let yourself be crazy about someone always be friends first being with people you love is what you remember make sure to find their good streaks ali ward thank you so much for sharing your many many good streaks with us today on three books i'm so appreciative of your time thanks for being my friend (laughs) you're the best you're the best thank you much to Ali Ward for being our guest on three books. Hey, everybody, it's just me, just Neil again. Not the person uh, beside you on the boss, although that opening, I hope you liked it, was a tribute to the wondrous beauty that is Ologies. If you do not already listen to Ologies, I highly recommend it. It's the number one show in science for a reason, and you don't even have to like science to like the show. It makes you like science. It makes you like Lots of things. It's funny. It's entertaining. It's just a gem. Ali is a gem. And I want to say thank you so much to her for coming on and giving us so many quotes to think about, including writing it down and being honest with yourself is such a first step, I feel like, to getting there. Because you have to admit that your desire is real. How many times do we talk about our goals or vision things, but we don't actually commit them to paper? And committing them to paper, yeah, absolutely. It makes it, it, makes it a complete reality. So this is kind of a takeoff of the book, Excuse Me, Your Life is Waiting, but I love that quote. Two, from the person who grew up underneath a news journalist, news is a business and it is for money. We are not fed what we need. We're fed what makes money. Let's be really, really aware about this point. You know, one thing I really love about Ologies, and there's many things, is that she really kind of puts the Patreon community of the show up and above everything else, right? She talks about patreon.com slash ologies all the time. As of last count, there's about 10,000 people on there that are paying like a dollar a month. And... She goes to that community. She asks questions to the community. She gets gets questions from the community. It's a community-driven show. And so much of what the podcasting world is turning out to be is advertising slathered shows. And of course, you can't control that because that's how it makes the shows big and popular and sells them. At the same time, let's be really aware that we're being sold to everywhere. And we have to just kind of hold inside of ourselves our own agency and be really sort of perceptive to notice how much we're being sold to on a given day. So I appreciate Ali reminding us of that. And the last thing she says, the more context I can give people on the minutia that they might have taken for granted, the more I feel like I can center us all into this human experience of being a living creature on the planet. 
the root emotion of ologies and certainly of Ali is one of love and of empathy and of acceptance and understanding. And I think that shines through in that quote and it shines through certainly on her show and I hope in this conversation too. Thank you so much to Ali War for giving us three more books to add to our top 1000. If you are new here, you can always head over to threebooks.co slash the top 1000 or just hit go to threebooks.co and there's a little clicky button at the top. And it's a list of every single one of the formative books we talk about on the show. Some people even say, I go to that first, Neil, then I see, I find a book I'm interested in, or I find a book I might be interested in, and I kind of reverse search to figure out what shows to listen to. That's totally acceptable. In this case, you've already listened to the show, I assume, if you're listening to this, in which case, you can go to the top 1000 and find number 667, My Side of the Mountain by Gene Craighead George, who had a fascinating life, climbing trees and counting owls and her brothers becoming falconers. It's just amazing. Number 666, excuse me, colon, your life is waiting by Lynn Grabhorn. How great a last name is that? Grab the, grab the bull by the horns. You certainly would if your last name is Grabhorn. And number 665, Galapagos by Kurt Vonnegut, which I believe, yes, I believe this is true, is our third Kurt Vonnegut book on the show, including from chapter 10 with the Land Mast Eye, number 973, Slaughterhouse 5, we got in the show. If you want to hear more about that, go to chapter 10. And chapter 101 with Daniels, the filmmakers who gave us Breakfast of Champions. And now we've got a third Vonnegut entry. Nobody has selected uh, Cat's Cradle yet, though. Isn't that his most popular? We can talk about that another time. However, it's time to bid you adieu, unless you want to stick around. It's time to bid you and say goodbye. Thank you so much, Dally Ward. Thank you to all of you for listening to Three Bucks. Are you still here? Did you make it past three second pause? If so, I want to welcome you back to the end of the podcast club. This is a club where I talk directly to you. You talk directly to me. We play your voicemails. We read your letters. It's an after party. It's one of three clubs that we have for Three Bucks members, including the Cover to Cover Club. That is people that listen to every single chapter of the show and the Secret Club. You got to call one eight three three. Read a lot to find more. And by the way, if you're listening to this, give me a call. I'd love to hear from you. Tell me about a formative book. Tell me about a chapter you like. Tell me about a guest you'd love on the show. You know what? We just had someone say, I really want Brian Stevenson on the show. It's We spent a year kind of tracking him down. It turns out I might be going down to see him in a few weeks in Austin. So fingers crossed that that one happens. But that's directly from a phone call. So if you're listening to this, call me. Who's a dream guest? What's a formative book? Let me know. one eight three three. read a lot And yes, that is a real number. I am paying for that. So one eight three three. read a lot Just dial me up and leave me a message. Here is this chapter's message now. Hello, Neil. My name is Bill Cimbello. I'm a teacher and a farmer from uh, Blacksburg, Virginia. You probably hear the birds and the insects in the background. And... I just love analog. I love paper. I love books and I love people. And I wanted to just kind of bring up the fact that a really amazing bookstore was started by the parent of some of my former students and it's called Blacksburg Books. And it is just trying to be the community hub that a bookstore truly can be. Thank you for the gift of your time and the gift of this podcast. Take care. Well, thank you so much, Bill Sinbella, for the gift of your phone call, the teacher and the farmer from Blacksburg, Virginia. I love that phrase. I love analog. I love paper. I love books. And I love people. I went over to the Blacksburg Books website. So first of all, like really, first of all, I just think it's amazing that, you know, when a bookstore has community in the design, like the shelves are put on wheels so that you can roll them away. There's an open space that people can rent out, that authors can come to visit, that people can play board games. I detected this strongly way back when we talked to Mitchell Kaplan. You remember down in Books and Books and Coral Gables. Um, what chapter number was that? What chapter was that? Chapter number 17? It was chapter number 16. I was close. He gave us Black Like Me by John Howard Griffin, The Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac, and Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. Yes, you can tell that I'm on the top 1,000 page right now. But he was talking about this in the design of books and books. And when I walked around that bookstore in Coral Gables, Florida, there's like, you know, old ladies playing Chinese checkers, right? There's there's people meeting with their book club. There's people using it as a community spot. They're they're also paying for that. They're buying salads and coffees. And they're, of course, you can't walk into a bookstore without walking out with a book. So it's kind of like a win win. But, you know, it's just wonderful. So, congratulations to 
And I have their names here. Congratulations to the brand new owners and operators of this wonderful Blackbird's Books, Blacksburg Books. That would be Ellen Woodall and Lori Kelly. You can follow them at Blacksburg Books on Instagram or Facebook. And their website is blacksburgbooks.com. That's B-L-A-C-K-S-B-U-R-G-B-O-O-K-S.com. Ah, thank you so much, Bill, for that phone call. Okay. And now it is time for a letter of the chapter. And this chapter's letter comes from Alexa Norezny, and I'm sharing the full name with permission. Dear Neil, I was like many other high school seniors when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, who became instantly disappointed when so many events I had waited my entire life for became canceled or were run virtually. Missing senior trips, final drama performances, sports games, prom, graduation, and even just the last few weeks of high school were heartbreaking. I took a gap year after high school to wait out this unknown world before moving out of my tiny home and into the big city to pursue my dream of attending film school. I thought I had waited enough time and I was going to get a mostly normal year, but I ended up completely living alone for the first time as we weren't allowed roommates, bounced back and forth between in-person and online classes, and struggled to meet new people. Clubs and activities ended up being canceled as the unexpected virtual world interrupted many people's plans. After a pretty crappy first-year experience, I moved home to find out that my high school boyfriend, who I'd started dating long distance with when we went away, had been cheating on me. Safe to say, I had lived over two years filled with unexpected turns, disappointment, hurt, and loneliness. Now, home for the summer, I looked at my bookshelf and I found I was looking for something to distract me and I bumped into You Are Awesome. I had not yet read this book. I went out to the back deck of my home, moved a chair into the sun, and I started reading. Once I started, it was hard to stop. Every single experience you wrote about and your way of seeing the positive side changed my whole outlook on everything I had gone through. It opened my eyes and caused me to look at my own life so differently. I honestly can't believe that after owning this book for quite a while, it wasn't not until this very confusing and emotionally overwhelming time in my life, I decided to read it. This book provided me with so much comfort and motivation, I can truly say it's helping me out of this depressive state that I've been in. Not only did the book mentally help me in ways I'm grateful for, it reminded me what dream I set up to chase when I started film school in the first place. I want to make people feel something. I want to make them see the world in new ways. I want to encourage people to share their stories with the world and be authentically themselves. This book provided me with so much. It reminded me how I want to create things that will provide these same feelings to others who need it and perhaps will stumble upon unexpectedly when they need it most. All the feelings and realizations remind me of what I want to do. All the hardships that I've experienced from the world, I think I forgot somewhere along the way what I was doing and why I was doing it in the first place. I really am hoping that through film school, I'm able to make even one more person feel the things in the way of the world that I and you are able to feel. This is the difference I hope to have in the world. Thank you so much for reading such a long message. I am going to put out into the universe that I am extremely grateful and thank you again. Sincerely, Alexa Neresny, 19 years old from York University. Wow, thank you so much for that beautiful letter, Alexa. Like always on the show, I will mail a signed copy of any of my books if your voicemail or your letter are read or listened to on the air as a little extra incentive or motivation to drop us a line. And I am going to try to take Allie's advice that she gave us in this podcast and beyond, which is I need to do a better job of promoting the show. The best way to help is to leave a review because the reviews, as we understand now, uh, really help the messages of our guests spread. So if you want more people to hear Ali, if you want more people to hear Katie Mack, if you want more people to hear Light Watkins, who's coming up soon, then let's see if we can start a campaign to try to raise awareness by leaving reviews. It really does help. And as an independent show with no sponsors, no platform, I got nothing coming in on this thing. Um, It would be really big help to get the messages out there. So thank you. And thank you, Alexa. Okay. Let's close off this chapter as we always do with a word of the chapter. Let's head over to Allie. I wrote this, like I wrote that down like so many years ago. And that is like just bonkers that it actually fell into place that way yes indeed it is bonkers 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 which has a lot of definitions according to our friends at miriam webster the informal definition is crazy comma mad such as a very fond enthusiastic or excited that's a positive right she's bonkers about the opera he's bonkers about her the fans went bonkers for the team okay cool we got that very fond enthusiastic excited but then there's also the almost exact opposite very angry very annoyed very bothered faced with the choice of being driven bonkers by their colicky infant or inviting outsider to live into their lives phil and julie decided to find a nanny 
Okay, that's an actual quote from a book list review. All right. There's also the sometimes offensive third definition, like having or showing severe mental illness. Meanwhile, the greedy trustees of her fortune are trying to confuse her enough to have her declared bonkers. Okay. It can be very fond, very angry, or sometimes offensive. What a confusing word. Where did it come from? Well, it came from way, 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 way deep underwater on UK submarine ships in the 1950s. What are you talking about, Neil? I'm talking about the fact that the etymology of the word bonkers is, in fact, from the naval slang term meaning slightly drunk, which came from the late 40s, early 50s, because you bonked your head, you thumped your head all over all the hanging metal parts of the submarine when you were a bit tipsy on underground, underground, underwater boats, which is kind of weird that they have alcohol on those underwater boats to begin with. But of course, if you drink alcohol on an underwater boat and you get slightly tipsy, you'd be hitting your head, thumping your head, or bonking your head, hence the word bonkers. Bonkers. It's not bonkers to have Ali on this show. It is joyful. It is joyful. It is joyfully bonkers. And it's joyfully bonkers to have you along with us. Thank you for the wonderful conversation. And until next time, remember that you are what you eat and you are what you read. Keep turning that page, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.